Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined by Mike Tholson today. Mike uh, works for Microsoft and is uh, responsible for a product that is very close to my heart in, in that it's the learning tools uh, which are designed to help people with dyslexia and other uh, language issues. Um, so, so Mike, tell us a bit about um, the work that you're doing and about yourself. This is, this is um, by the way, great stuff that you're doing. So um, I'm very excited to have you join us today. Thanks. So yes, I work on the Microsoft education team. I'm on the product and engineering side. And I do a lot of work around inclusive classroom is kind of the, the holistic way we talk about it. And so for that inclusive classroom, I do Microsoft learning tools, like you mentioned. Uh, we also think about inclusive writing. We just announced more recently, we're getting into some math as well as inclusive student and parent communication and focus. Those are sort of the, the categories. And then I also do stuff with OneNote in education, sort of separate from inclusive classroom. That's my, my day job. And yeah, I, I've been at Microsoft my entire career, over 20 years, and I've been working in the education space probably 12 to 13 years at this point. Okay, fantastic. And um, so, so the, can you tell us a little bit about what, for those that don't know, um, and for those of us that are a long time out of education, uh, what are learning tools uh, and what are some of the, the, the cool things that you can do with learning tools? Well, the, the overall brand or concept, Microsoft Learning Tools, it, there are a set of tools and actually the background was, uh, there was a set of people inside the company. I, I was part of a small group a few years ago. We took place in a Microsoft Hackathon, which is this event one week out of the year where anyone in the company can work on any project they want, any passion project, and you can work with any person on anything. And so I actually got pulled into a group where we had a speech pathologist, we had reading experts, font experts, accessibility experts, and we said, what if we took the latest science and research around reading, but we focus inclusively on dyslexia as a core customer persona? We said, let's see what we can do just in this week using the latest technologies and the science we know around reading and see what we come up with. And the idea was, hey, if we can focus on dyslexia, but inclusively, our hypothesis is that this will help lots of people with reading, not just people with dyslexia, but it'll help all sorts of people. And so we built this little experimental add-in, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more of what that does when I'm done, but we took this add-in in the hackathon a few years ago, and then we started working with teachers and schools and other experts and started iterating on it and improving it. And we started getting a lot of feedback. And then ultimately over the last few years, we've built these technologies into our mainstream products like Office and Windows, and these are available for free. But in terms of what it, what it does, uh, it has a, a set of techniques. It has some basic text-to-speech and word and line highlighting just built in. And while that's not new, one of the things that we say over and over again is that we say it's built in, mainstream, non-stigmatizing, and free. If I'm using Word and all of a sudden I can use text-to-speech on anything, you know, that's a great benefit that helps everyone or anyone who wants to use it. So we have, we have text-to-speech. We also have the ability to change the way the page looks. So things like the ability to increase line and letter and word spacing, so reducing visual crowding, you can do really easily. We have the ability to change the background colors. Some people might prefer different colored backgrounds while they're reading. And so you can choose any of those colors and they're fine-tuned for accessibility standards and contrast. You can make the text much bigger or smaller, so visual impairments or short line mode or, or other places. And then we have grammar options. So the ability to break all the words on the page into syllables with a single click. And that's using our cognitive services uh, backend. And things like highlighting different nouns and verbs and adjectives and being able to focus the lines the line focus that can reduce distractions and then things like a picture dictionary. So that's a that's a summary and we're trying to build that into as many products as we can and make it available on many platforms as we can. So, so, uh, so uh, considering all, you know, sometimes the, the resources that schools have, you know, uh, sometimes they don't really have you know, uh, technology, something that many of them struggle with. What type of work are you doing, especially with 
teachers in order to help them within the space of the classroom to make sure that the students can take advantage of those tools because sometimes you know they might not have time to go through them and they might have the software but no they don't know how they could benefit from it that's a great question so in terms of teacher awareness teacher training student awareness and training we're, we're working on that right now. And there's a set of things we have and there's more things we're working on. So for example, we've created a whole set of professional development courses for teachers. And we've got really short versions. We have medium versions. We've got really big versions. So we kind of let the schools decide what they want to do because some schools don't have the time to do an all day training. And honestly, a lot of our tools don't need an all day training, but if you want to go really deep, maybe, but we also have, bite-sized chunks, so just a couple of minutes worth, or a five-minute demo, or a 30-minute training. And then, in addition to online courses, we have um, courses that can be downloaded and done in the school, so any educator can do trainings within the school, so it's prepackaged and ready. We have partner training companies. We have Microsoft stores, although in the UK, they're not, uh, we haven't rolled out all the stores in the UK, but in the United States, we have educator trainers that can visit schools but for the educators themselves in the classroom, um, what we found, a lot of it because our learning tools are designed to be able to be used by anywhere from kindergarten to third grade to sixth grade to high school and everywhere in between, the user interface is designed to be fairly straightforward. And what we've been finding is that oftentimes an educator will just have to show a student how to launch them. Uh, not even go into in-depth training. I mean, many educators might do that. I've seen teachers sit down in front of the class and show every kid in the class, okay, here's their immersive reader button. Here's some things you can do with it. And the best way I've seen it done is where they don't just say, oh, these three people are going to use the immersive reader and all the other kids aren't. It's actually rolled out as, here's some tools that can any of you can use and they can help you when you're reading. And you can use this way, you could use it that way and then let the kids choose and they can personalize. But they're designed to be pretty easy to use in terms of adoption from students. Uh, it's more about the teacher awareness and getting, I think like you had said, getting the teachers aware and making them feel comfortable to be able to roll them out. And on the student side, it's typically, you know, they pick it up almost instantly. Uh, I, I, I think that actually this is something that was discussed in a, a meeting I was in yesterday where we were, talking at a university level about um, actually it's not about teaching the students it's about <laughs> teaching the teachers uh, a, a lot of this stuff because uh, you know, they're not necessarily uh, on top of the technology they're not necessarily aware if anything it can all be a bit overwhelming and certainly as as we're um, certainly this is something we see as technologists even outside of education, but in the workplace, you know, the, the, the pace of change is accelerating and, and, and yes, the, the, the friction to, to, learn new, uh, to learn these new skills, to adopt the technologies is, is sometimes great. And, and even though this stuff may help us, um, it's finding the time to step back and, and, and learn how to use it and how to integrate these things that, that can be of real benefit to you into your way of working and your routines and everything else. So, so the adoptions, the adoptions are an, an interesting one. I think that um, making it ubiquitous helps. So I'm really pleased to see the journey from uh, a sort of confined tool as it started to spread into other parts of the the Microsoft feature set. Yeah. Long may that continue. I want to see it. Everywhere. Oh, it will. It will, my friend. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I'm very keen for that because you know one of the questions that I've asked is like, why is it all right to have narrator, you know, ubiquitous, um, you know, which deals with the needs of one set of people, but not something that you know does an equally great job for another set of people, which are many times as numerous. Um, so, so it's 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 that ubiquity is really important that the spread of the tools is is uh, for me a really good sign um i'm really interested to to see some some adaptations to um 
as as we transition to from schools to workplace to you know I think the stuff that you've got in edge is like looking slightly different to the stuff that you've had in in the education sector, and and I think that that's going to help adoption as uh, um, too. I'm with you a hundred percent on the idea that it's destigmatizing, because one of the things that that we've seen time and time again is that. It's really hard to ask people to um, declare about disability and to actually stand up and say, this is something I need uh, and, and this is going to help me do my job better. And, and by the way, this is me having a disability. Those are big, scary things for people to do. In fact, they're less scary in an education environment than they are in a, in a workplace environment. I think that in, in education, education set up to be more inclusive. It's by no means perfect, but it's set up to be inclusive. Certainly in the UK, they're marked on results and how people have achieved and stuff like that. And so they're incentivized by the way the system is structured to be inclusive and to provide the, the aids that people need. My, my feeling and experience is business, is a, the business world in general is a little bit more brutal than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and real life is a little bit more brutal than that and that, that, that uh, there are performance issues and shareholder value issues and all of the rest of it. Now, Hector and Jenny Leifari and I will all go out and Deborah Rue will all go out and tell business, hey, actually putting these tools in place will improve your business performance. But, but there has been this perception that doing accessibility is expensive. And I'm sure that um, that that's something that that you would have come across previously as well. That 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 the assistive technology is expensive and implementation difficult and all the rest of it. So, so how how do you address those kind of prejudices against technology? Not prejudices against people, but prejudices against uh, inclusive technology. Well, what's interesting is at least for me, I can only speak for myself, yeah. in both schools and I've worked with some businesses and definitely higher education, I agree that there's a perception that, oh, this assistive technology that you're about to show me or talk about clearly will be charged a lot of money for this. And when they find out that there's no money involved, it's actually built in and, and free in many cases, and there's no extra cost, there's no extra licensing, they're a they have a little bit of shock <laughs> in, in a positive way but b that that actually makes because it's built in and free it makes it much more amenable to deploy broadly and we've run into districts and even some companies that say the fact that it's just built into office actually makes us want to deploy the we have this we just haven't updated the latest versions because for various reasons but it actually drives them to want to move forwards because uh, the inclusion part means anyone can use this. I mean, just to give an example from the workplace, I got a mail from a CIO of a large company who's been using the learning tools built into Microsoft Word. And it was essentially a thankful mail where he said, kind of like you had said, and then this, in this, I'm not gonna name any names or companies, but he had said, it's not something that he'd shared broadly in his job, but when he found these tools built into Word, and he's dyslexic, it was hugely helpful. And so it's similar in schools where it's not that every dyslexic in the education system either has been identified or has been in a place where uh, they even know in many cases. And the fact that in, at least in the US, I can't speak to the UK, but in the US there's many states and districts that even the word dyslexia and what it is and what it means is, is not agreed on, unfortunately. And so when these tools are available, like whether you say you're teaching a set of dyslexic students or whether you're saying you're teaching students who have reading challenges and you're not using the words dyslexia in your district for whatever reason, these tools can help. And because they're built in and they get broad adoption and they're free, all of a sudden it might be the opposite where they say, Oh, we were paying a lot of extra money and it was complicated to install and license and all these other things for some other pieces. And now some of these things are built in and free and available to anyone. 
it has a, you have to break through the initial assumptions like you had said that, oh, it's gonna be really expensive and complicated and gosh, this is just hard. When they find out it's part of Office or Windows and it's multi-platforms, you know, iPads and Macs and browsers as well, usually the response is, oh, well, how can we get this deployed as fast as we can? So uh, the initial response is a little bit of an assumption of maybe the past, but once yeah. you break through that, a lot of goodness usually comes from it. Uh, and and I have observed a, a few scenarios where in, in schools here in, in, in Ireland where uh, kids with dyslexia will say, oh, um, oh, they can use this special software. And oh, we are putting them in a position of advantage regarding other kids. When in fact, you are just putting in the same situation than the other kids, you know, in order to be able to compete and to do their work. So if I read it right in the model that you are pursuing, that somehow being some is going to democratize the school because they are available to everyone. You don't need, it's not just for one, it's for, it's for everyone. So that thing about saying, oh, we are giving an advantage to a group, it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't make sense anymore. Exactly. And it's not just learning tools, it seems like speech to text. We have speech to text built in in all of our software now. And we're rolling out lightweight word prediction built into Windows that's available to anyone. Whether you're dyslexic or dysgraphic or whether you broke your arm and you can't type, speech to text, it turns out, is really helpful. And so, like you said, when it's built in and mainstream and non-stigmatizing, uh, a lot of those barriers seem to start falling down, what we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, you, yeah. Go on, Anthony. You are currently doing this uh, in mainly in the English language, am I correct? Well, Antonio, the good news is that you're not correct. Okay. <laughs> We're okay. doing it in many languages. Okay. Um, uh, Microsoft Learning Tools, for example, is available in, I believe, over 45 languages. And speech to text is more limited now. It's in about nine languages. We, we hope to be creating more and bringing it more in the future. But part of our goal is global scale. Like one of the benefits that I'm so excited about working at Microsoft is that you know, our vision is to empower every person on the planet. And that means not just empowering uh, English people who don't have dyslexia, <laughs> it means empowering every person on the planet. And so that means all languages, that means all abilities, that means everyone. And so that's the scale that, that I think our company can help bring. Now it won't happen overnight that we get every single language and every single platform, but that's our goal. Excellent. And uh, I'm a long-term speech to text user. I, I actually started my accessibility journey testing out dictation systems nearly 20 years ago, reading out the uh, the scripts that were necessary to train them. And uh, so, yeah, I know uh, if, if you're familiar with them, you'll be familiar with the sort of down the rabbit hole stories from Alice in Wonderland and, and all of the scripts for test, training Dragon and IBM via voice back in the day. So um, those tools made a huge difference to my life. Um, they were instrumental in me actually uh, being able to do my masters and and uh, and have fostered a career in assistive technology and accessibility for the last couple of decades i think that again as you say scale is important because these were niche tools um actually speech to text has been pretty good for quite a long time but it's been really bloody expensive mm. you know you would pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars for a single license and the friction was in the setup so um the microphone quality needed to be good you needed to have a powerful system the, the you know, um we used to actually build computers specifically to 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 do speech recognition um, and you'd have to think about things like mechanical noise interference, so the placement of the fans and the sound card and all this kind of stuff. These days, most ordinary hardware is perfectly capable of, of giving you good speech recognition results. So um, that's improving. Um, people are used to 
um, talking to their devices. So I think that you know the barriers to adoption for some of this stuff, um, not only technological but sociological in terms of acceptance of speech interfaces, you know, are being removed quite rapidly now. So we're we're, we're really, I think, on the cusp of, of real mass adoption. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've always thought was really difficult to do well, because it's really easy to speak at a computer, it's less, it's less easy to get it to do what you want. So, so, um, so, so the speech to text bit's quite easy. Um, the getting it to correct the text bit is quite difficult. Uh, and the controlling your machine by voice is another order of magnitude more tricky um, in terms of you know, doing the more complex stuff. So um, I, th I think that, you know, for me, you know, I'm I'm lucky. Really, the only thing I I really need it for is text composition. But um, do you do you think we're close to seeing um, more in terms of being able to speech control your PC? You know, obviously we've got Cortana, and we've got Siri, and we've got Alexa, and all of these other uh, virtual assistants. How deep do you think that integration is going to to go over the next few years? Do you think we'll be able to automate a lot more? And because obviously that's going to have a massively positive impact for people with disabilities. Oh yeah, I think we're just starting now. I can only speak to Microsoft. I mean, the other industry, mm -hmm. the industry in general, like you said, is obviously moving forwards and very quickly now. But from Microsoft's perspective, yes, I do expect in the coming years, Right now, we're just getting the basics of call it dictation and Cortana can do some things, but that'll get more and more improved and being able to control Office with your voice in a more powerful way and Windows, that's all definite areas that we are investing in and we'll see improvement in in the future. It's just a matter of time and I think now that voice is getting so prevalent that it's not it's not a if, it's a when. And the, um, the other thing, just to mention, we recently made these big announcements about a week ago at the Made by Dyslexia Summit, but one of them for speech to text was that we're bringing a dictation, actually it's in the process of rolling out right now. I think it's it's rolling out globally in the next week or two. But Word Online, so our free web version of Word and our free web version of OneNote, we're both adding dictation to both of those apps. And then and in 2019, we'll be adding it to Excel Web and PowerPoint Web. An Outlook Web. And I would like to mention that because I'm sure you are aware of this because you guys are all up to date on stuff. But there's a lot of people out there who think Office, Microsoft Office means Word desktop and I pay money for it. And we have free web apps that are free to any person and you know, any school. And we're rolling out lots of capabilities in our free web apps, including speech to text. So it works on any device in that at that point. So we're continuing to roll speech to text more and more in our other products and platforms. And actually one other thing I, I wanna make sure I get in from Antonio's question because it, it, I thought of this as I was about to talk about speech to text. That same announcement last week, we also, back to languages, we announced that we're bringing real-time translation into the immersive reader on all of our different platforms. We announced that last week. That's rolling out probably in a month or so. So what that means is in any, if I'm in the immersive reader in Word or OneNote Online or stuff on the iPad or Teams, wherever, I can have all my text and in the immersive reader change and choose another language like Spanish. And I can flip the entire document, meaning text to speech, syllables, parts of speech, picture dictionary, all flips to Spanish for the whole document. Or I can even just choose by word. So I've got English text, maybe I'm a non-native speaker or English language learner. If I choose by word, now I can click on my English document to get a picture and it'll show me the English word and the Spanish word and I can listen to them each out loud and see that picture at the same time. And then also later by sentence. So I'll be able to real-time translate an immersive reader by document, sentence, or word. So I just figured I'd throw that out there too, in many languages. That's really cool. Um, so can we expect one day to Cortana to become our language coach? Uh, maybe. I, I can't speak to what Cortana <laughs> may or may not do, but I think that's a great idea. I think um, 
you know, language learning is, is a huge area. I, I'm, I'm at the International Dyslexia Association Conference right now, and well, a popular topic is this, and this is for the United States, but I'm sure it's similar to different countries. If you're a non-native speaker in a country, uh, that you're already learning the language, and guess what? A large number of those people are going to be dyslexic as well. So now you're a dyslexic second language learner, and that is a double hard thing to have to do at the same time. And so if we can bring uh, these real-time translation and language learning features into our learning tools and apply the same techniques that are helping with reading and, and dyslexia, th there's not many companies out there that are able to do that. And that's why I'm excited to we can really help a whole population that I don't think people think first thing they think of a non-native speaker is dyslexic also, but it turns out there's a lot of people like that. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's you know, really, really true. I, I also think about the, the business population. So um, you have huge amounts of, uh, particularly English, because people use English as the business language. So you know, within our own organization, we've got 120,000 people, of which probably only a fifth for, of whom you know, English is, a nat is their native language. So 80% you know, of the, the population of our company would benefit from learning tools or reading tools or, or support for English as a, you know, as a, a second language. So mm -hmm. I see really huge benefits for, for tools that can help people with, with language, not only just in, in terms of comprehension, but also in terms of composition as well, because we see it all the time. You've got, um, we're united by one broken version of English, you know, because because for, for for the most part, you know, you've got people and and then the lingua franca to uh, is, is English, and yet, um, it, you know, you've got ten people in a room, none of whom for whom it is their first language, who could all do with the with the help um, to to arrive at a sort of common definition and clarity and everything else, and certainly if we're doing sort of document creation and review, I can see this being, you know, a real benefit to, to, to organizations that sort of, a, 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 you know, across the world. So I think it's Absolutely. exciting. Time. And one of the things also is that when you have one of the things with education in our tools is when you graduate and assuming you go into the workforce, then having tools that move with you where everything's built in is just a benefit if you need these tools and extra assistance. It's not that I'm in school, I use some specialized tools, and then I go to the workforce, and I have none of those tools anymore. It's more like they can travel with you into the workforce. That's a really interesting point, because I used to work in the education sector, and we used to provide all of these tools to students, and they have wonderful amount of kit, they have all of the assistive technology, the support, everything else, and there are, grant-based systems in the UK that would allow you to get these tools when you go into work. But what we saw was just this sort of cliff that would fall off in terms of uptake and use of the technology. So they would be out of the closet with their dyslexia or their, their disability in university and in the education system. And they would go back into the closet when they went into the, the, the employment market because they were nervous about disclosure, they were concerned that you know, having a disability might mark them as different or that they might not get a job or that they might you know, not get promotion, etc. So there was a real reticence to, to get what they were entitled to, to have. Um, and, and so, again, integration, reduction of stigma really comes into play and hopefully we'll have a long term benefit on people's careers because they don't feel like they they ha a don't feel like they have to um, declare straight away but but also over time I think we'll be creating a different mindset in general um, mm -hmm. where we're, we're creating some, a kind of environment where people are more comfortable about using these tools and more comfortable about talking about dyslexia neurodiversity dyspraxia dyscalculia etc because 
there are technologies that are commonly available that enable them to be successful. And so, so we're you know, not only destigmatizing the tools, but we're destigmatizing the the neurodiverse conditions as well. Absolutely, we agree. So, yeah. So, um, so, so tell me a bit about the the International Dyslexia Association conference. What are the what are the hot topics other than sort of technologies that that you're expecting to see over the next few days? Yeah, well, I'm here at the conference. It's in Connecticut. I would say one of the topics, I mean, the theme is, is uh, at least one of the big panel themes was, can we know what we know? Meaning there's a lot known about dyslexia now. What are we going to do about it? And so I think at least in the United States, there is definitely a push on, there's different legislation happening in different states where around uh, dyslexia identification and screening at an earlier age. And there's still a lot of passion around, not every school in the United States thinks about dyslexia in the same way or even identifies dyslexia in the same way. So there's, I think there's some frustration still of how can we get that more widely known and widely disseminated. And, and there's a real big push on teacher training. A lot of teachers graduate from, from teaching colleges, so pre-service, uh, not necessarily getting a lot of background or training on dyslexia or reading disabilities or related areas. And so it's not their own fault. It's just the, the college might not be really focusing on that. And so they get into schools and they don't have all that background. So there's a lot of focus on how can we help improve the professional development around dyslexia and reading and getting that widely disseminated. So that's been some of the areas that I've seen a focus. And the other one that this is, I'm really excited about, uh, I was I had a total fanboy moment yesterday, which was I got to meet Sally and Bennett Shaywitz. Are you familiar with Sally Shaywitz and her work? She was kind of the seminal leader in the world of dyslexia. She's a doctor. She's done for decades. She's worked with Congress members. She's helped get legislation passed. She's written some of those popular books in the history of dyslexia. She's helped untold numbers of people. She's a chair at the Yale University of the Dyslexia Center. But she came, her and her husband, they're a bit older now, uh, both doctors. But I got to have about an hour and a half long discussion with her yesterday, which was just amazing. And walking down the hallway at this conference, every single person at this conference would come up. It'd be I was like walking with a rock star because they just come up and say, Sally, Sally, can I hug you? Can I take a picture? Can I you know, you autograph and it was pretty amazing because they know she's helped so many people. So it was amazing to to meet uh, Sally and Bennett Shaywitz. No, it's quite Fantastic. interesting when people who, who help others reach that status, you know, you know, it's, I think it's much more enjoyable to be in a session like that and have people like that go near you when you are near them than if you were mm -hmm. with a, no, a movie star or someone like that. I think it's it's quite rewarding to, to I, uh, that's, my, my my feeling about it. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. I think that that um, the Shaywitz is a not so well known in the UK. We've had our own sort of whole dyslexia culture, and you know, we've got the British Dyslexia Association. Certainly, can attest to all of the same kind of things. You know, we uh, they've been pressing for um, edu mandatory dyslexia education is part of teacher education, teacher training and so on. Uh, and you know, there've been numerous government reports like the Rose Report talk addressing this, you know, dyslexia in the in the education sector. So I think it's really important that we bring together this stuff across um across national divides, across language divides and, and everything else. I think there's some really interesting areas to consider around cognitive accessibility when we look at some of the issues that are not so much around reading, but around memory and how we perceive stuff, which I think is 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 really interesting and affects how we use products and services and sense of time, for example, you know, especially with people that, that are dyscalculic and, and money and all these kind of things. So there's there's loads of stuff where I think that that some of the uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and and digital assistance can really bring great benefit to people in, in, in the future. So I'm really excited about that. Um, 
Well, and actually, really, we just announced also that we're going to be focusing more on dyscalculia. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but that's an area that we announced last week of um, starting to look into that space more as well. So there you go. Oh, well, that's fantastic because I did um, I, I know a bit about this stuff because we I was involved in in creating the first online screener for that oh. uh, a number of years back, um, and I did a lot of the work for the W3C. Um, cognitive Accessibility Task Force, particularly on dyscalculia. So it, it's uh, an area that has been so massively overlooked uh, mm -hmm. and has such a huge impact on people because, if anything, the stigma of innumeracy is even greater than that of illiteracy. You know, and, and people hide it. You know, I've, uh, we've got tales of, of people um, who who luckily in the UK, I mean, we have different colored notes. I mean, you guys are crazy with all your green notes. Luckily, you've got, you know, <laughs> tools now like seeing AI, which will announce what it is. It still doesn't tell you, it won't help you that much if you just calculate because you still won't have any concept of what 20 and one is, but, um, but uh, yeah. So uh, there's one lady that would always pay with a purple because she knew it was a big enough note that we, it would cover most things. So she would have a collection of purples in her wallet and she would go out, she would pay with the purple, she'd come back with loads of change and give the change to her partner. Her partner would go and get them changed back up into 20 pound notes again. And that was the only way she could cope. Uh, this has been fascinating. Um, we've reached the end of our half hour. Need to thank as always uh, our friends and supporters, Barclays and My Clear Text for helping us keep the lights on and be accessible. And, and thank you once again, Mike Holson. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. Um, and I'm sure we'll be talking again in the near future. Look forward great. to tweeting with you shortly. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It's been great. Really nice talking.